New Hope Church. Thank God for another Bible study and an opportunity that he has blessed us to come together to study his word together, to grow closer to him, to those that are online. Praise God for you as well. And we're going to begin with prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for another opportunity that you have blessed us to assemble together, Lord God, with a desire to study your word, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for what you have prepared on tonight, Lord, and we ask that you will guide and lead us in your word, direct us, Lord God, according to your will, Lord God, and your vision, Lord God, for this house in the name of Jesus. We give you the praise, the glory, and the honor on tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So tonight you'll find me in the last chapter of Judges. And we're going to look at one verse on tonight. So we're going to do Judges, the 21st chapter and the 25th verse. And then we're going to move over one chapter into Ruth and read a few scriptures there. Amen. Let us begin. Judges 21 and 25. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Ruth 1, beginning at the first verse. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the name of the two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephraites from Bethlehem, Judah, sorry. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other named Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Milan and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Amen. Thank God for the reading of this word. We are yet focusing on a blessed legacy, and tonight I will be between the computer and also the Bible. The last verse in the last chapter of the book of Judges closes with a descriptive statement that defines the lack of structure and chaotic activity among Israel. Simply put, everyone was doing whatever they wanted and there was chaos without a king. But this was not God's plan. He had set them apart to be his covenant people. He used Israel as an example to demonstrate his love. And he also gave us the opportunity to know what a loving relationship in the will of God can produce when obedient. I gained a better understanding during the theology teaching when Pastor Emeritus explained that the Bible is God's self-revelation to humanity. It is the vehicle he chose to reveal himself to humanity. So you and I might want to trust the vehicle God chose. Amen. The story of the children of Israel is probably one of the first we learn as children. It is the one we are all most acquainted with. God uses Moses to lead them out of Egypt, out of slavery to a life of freedom. Then Joshua takes them into the promised land. But when Joshua and his generation die, the Israelites begin intermarrying with pagans, worshiping false gods, and disobeying the laws of Moses. They rejected God as their ruler, choosing to live life their own way without him. Sound like anybody you know? Yeah, me. As my parents were around, anytime my parents were around, I found myself following instructions. 
And I did what I was told to do most of the time. But when I did, but what I didn't realize in not obeying my parents was that I was setting a precedent that would carry over as I grew older. When I started school, I recognized authority and understood following instruction. But I also fairly quickly identified their limits. They could put me in timeout, right? Or they could give me a, a recess detention. I could deal with that. But as I got older, you eventually move on to employment. And these behaviors move with you. So as I moved to employment, again, I identified authority, understood the instructions given to me, and responsibilities required of me. But I also, again, identified the limits. Before long, you know, you find yourself taking a little extra, a little more break time than what you were originally given. Leaving just a little bit early. Putting off work responsibilities for another day. That can wait. You tell yourself, there's a tier warning system here. It's not like they're going to put me in jail. I can live with that. But what we don't immediately consider in our actions or when living a life on our own terms is that there's this thing called reputation that we are building that follows us just about everywhere we go and has the potential to crush some of the most important hopes and dreams we have, especially now that there are cell phones, cameras, and social media outlets. So it's important to be mindful of the choices that we make and the effect it has not only on us, but others. We wanna support souls as they move to life in Christ, not give them more excuses to remain in bondage. We see through the example of the Israelites that life doesn't go in the direction we intend or turn out exactly as we plan because it's not and never was within our control. When we exalt creation, when we exalt creation as God, instead of the true and living God, the potential for failure increases exponentially. Because as my husband says, when he quotes Jay-Z, before you come into the knowledge of Christ, everyone has their own truth. The lesson here, yoke up with Jesus and learn from him. For he is gentle and lowly in heart. And we do find rest for our souls. It was a constant cycle with Israel. Every time a judge died, they went astray again, returning to sinful practices and idolatry. Israel rebelled, God disciplined, then Israel repented, and God delivered them. You see, God yet loved Israel, and that same unconditional love exists today. But what did God do? when Israel was disobedient. Early in Judges, we see that he hands them over to their enemies as a form of discipline, not to destroy them, but to guide them back to him. But he also is in control of the famine. God is meticulous in his strategy to remain in relationship with his children. As we move over into Ruth, we see that God also sent the famine on the land and his judgment on a fallen people. Bethlehem, which actually means house of bread, had been named as a result of all the extra grain they collected. So it seemed odd and perhaps even out of character that a country whose name is house of bread would not be able to produce bread, right? One writer said it like this, it's like when you go to the city of Philadelphia and you see gang warfare in Philadelphia, 
it kind of doesn't make sense that it's called the city of brotherly love, right? <laughs> or when you realize there are demonic forces and demonic activities in the city of Los Angeles, which is called the city of angels. I'm going to add, it's like, let's just bring it down. When you go to KFC, Popeyes, or Kennedy Chicken, and there is no what? Chicken. Okay? <laughs> God does not always meet our expectations. Lesson learned. And this is something I was reminded of recently. I made a decision on God's behalf. I thought and I had sought the Lord, but I did not wait on the Lord. And I was very, very concerned about a condition that one of my siblings was entering into. And I did not want them to be out at a certain hour at night in dangerous areas trying to make a living. And so it bothered me. And it bothered me to the point where I made a decision. I stepped out and I helped my sibling. Now, let's just fast forward a little bit. God had already had a job prepared that was not in a dangerous area, that was not gonna have my sibling out late or um, trying to um, build financial stability in a way that was gonna jeopardize her. I did not know it, he did not tell me, and he did not show it to her either. Because what he was doing was he was helping her learn to trust him, right? So here I am, loving God's love, protecting, wanting to be able to help someone else. And I stepped into a hole. And I stepped into such a deep hole, trying to help out. You know what God did? He moved her right along and he gave her the job. And he let me remain in the hole I created. And the reason, part of the reason, because there is so much more to this, was because it, he had to show me, first of all, you don't step into my shoes. That was the first lesson I, heard, I learned like right away. Don't, don't get in God's shoes, okay? <laughs> you pray for people, you, you guide them through the word of God, but don't try to be God, okay? And for as long as I've been in this way, I am still being reminded of certain things. You know, every now and then you get to a point in righteousness and God has to remind you of where you really are and who he truly is. So I did this thing and God left me in the hole. <laughs> and thank God he left me in the hole because what it did was it opened up my ears and it opened up my eyes to the word of God. It drew me closer to him. God has a way, and I taught a lesson about on purpose and things happening on purpose and God leading you to dead ends on purpose. Sometimes God will let you lead yourself to a dead end on purpose so that he can show you that you're not really listening. You're, not, you're praying, but you're not truly praying. There's things that I need to, for you to see and you, you're missing those things. So Pastor taught, Pastor Emeritus, he taught, and he was saying in his teaching, and forgive me for using these so many examples from him, but I want you to, I want you to help, I want to help you get what I'm saying here. He taught a lesson about the snakes biting and the people dying. And the people wanting the snakes to stop biting, not because they desired God and to do God's will, but because they more or less wanted their own way to continue. And my prayer became in that moment, Lord God, show me the way out, not that the snake stop biting and I stop dying, but that I truly get on the path that you created or you desire for me to be on. I received a phone call and I refused to move because I said, I do not know if this is the way that God wants me to go. I am going to wait. It is at that moment that I realized that I was repositioning myself 
to hear from God and to move when God says move and to do what God says do. So a couple of Sundays later, Pastor Smith comes along and he says, do what the Lord says do. <laughs> and I'm sitting there and I just, just the tears began to roll down my eyes. I said, Lord, I will do what you, what you say do, right? You never know how God is going to speak. Israel did not know how God was going to speak. He did not know, they did not know, although they took for granted that the, the house of bread and the fact that the ground was plentiful and brought forth lots of grain would always be that way. And God touched the very thing that we take sometimes for granted. He touches that very thing, you know why? Because he knows how to get your attention and draw you back to him. And we have learned several times that our pain is not always uh, coming from the enemy or the devil or from Satan, hell, whatever you want to call him. Sometimes it's coming from God because God needs to get your attention. He's trying to reposition you back into position because you can be so joyful and rejoicing and don't realize that you stepped outside of not the will of God but just seeking God on a daily basis you wake up in the morning and you get up and you just go you come home and you got this responsibility that responsibility and before you know it it's nighttime and you haven't opened the word but you still love God and you're willing to serve God but you're not doing all that you can to remain strengthened and ready in the event that God needs to use you. It's kind of like you can't even remember somebody quotes a scripture, you don't even know if that's really in the word of God <laughs> because you haven't been studying. You become slack and when you become slack, you begin to forget some things. And God is saying, now is not the time. Now is not the time. I need you in position and I need you to continue to build yourself up. All of us build ourselves up in the word of God because I'm not gonna get ahead of myself, but things are changing on a daily basis right in front of our face. And God is saying to us, I still have a remnant here. I still have a people that will hear from me. I still have a people willing to do my will and to go forth and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to a world that does not want to know, to a world that is dying and does not even realize that that is what's happening to them. I'm gonna get there again. I'm gonna go back to that. Hold that thought right there. God does not always meet our expectations. And this is something I was reminded of recently. As Christians, we are tempted to believe that if we take care of our relationship with God, if I live according to God's word, if I do, you know, the things that God is requiring of me, he will fulfill my very desire. However, we must not treat God. We must not treat the God of the universe like the gods of pagans. He does promise to care for us, yet not always in the way that we expect. So when you pray, don't pray with the expectation of this is how it's going to come out already and then look for God to do that. Because that very thing may show up and it was not what God intended to be the exit for you. And when you exit off that ramp, it is then that you realize, oh my goodness, this was not the will of God for my life. But it's because sometimes, and I'm not saying all the time, when we go to God, the human part of us understands or is familiar with the situation and so when we pray we're praying and we kind of already have some type of mm, sense of how it might work out or or what god can do and you know god is going to god will bring me out yes he will but you've got to know that it's according to the word of god does it line up with the word of god search it make sure it lines up with the word of god this exit or this, this way out that's being made for you, does it line up with this word? Or is it just even a slightly bit off? 
Because if it's even a slightly bit off, we know Satan knows the word of God. He quoted it to Jesus Christ when he was tempting him. But it wasn't exact. Because it was coming from who? It was coming from him. And if, he obeyed, if Christ obeyed him, then it, what God intended would not have been fulfilled. So we have to just, just make sure, take the time to make sure. It's not hard. And if you have to, God will confirm it more than one time. So we move on over into the first verse. And the first verse says, in the days when the judges ruled, of Ruth, excuse me, Ruth 1 and 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And so I was kind of like, in the days when the judges ruled, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. I was like, why the judges? You know, like, it's kind of like when they assign you something, and the hardest part falls on you, right? <laughs> and you want to know, well, why didn't they get the hard part, right? Why did the famine have to fall when I'm in charge? <laughs> why couldn't the famine happen when it was their time? God assigned judges in order, consecutive order. And at this time, the judges were ruling, and it was hunger that came into the land. A famine came. And again, house of bread is where is what Bethlehem was known for. So a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Sometimes when things get a little tough, one of the first things we want to do is get out. <laughs> Move away from here. There's a family here, there's no food. Where's their food? Let's find, a, let's find a location and let's move there. It has to be the will of God that you know we not starve and that we move over here to this land. So Elimelech makes a decision. The name of the man was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the name of the two sons were Milan and Kilion. They were Ephraites, Ephratites. And Beth, from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab, and they lived there. They left Bethlehem, and they went to Moab, and they settled in Moab. And the Bible doesn't say that Moab had a famine. It says Bethlehem had a famine. So at this time, their needs were able to be met in Moab, and they lived there. But again, when situations arise, gain an understanding in God's word of what God is trying to do. God is trying to draw us closer to him. The scripture in Chronicles says, if I shut up heaven and there be no rain. If we take a moment and we think about what's happening on the earth right now in this time, and we see the dry conditions. If we take a look at the availability right now or the politicization of everything that's happening in the government, if we take a look at how they are not able to unify, to make decisions, and when they do make decisions, it's one strong arm because they have the most votes making a decision and the other minority having to accept the decision. They are not working together. There are illegal guns in enormous amounts entering the country and state to state moving across state lines. There are viruses that are occurring right now and no sooner than we kind of sort of get a handle on one, something else is coming. Inflation is pressing and squeezing the people so tightly until they don't know from week to week where the next meal is coming from. There have been, there has been a bug released and I wanna say it's not, it says, um, it's not uh, locusts. They are lanterns. 
At that time, it was locusts. At that time, there was a famine. But look at the things that are happening now and how they mimic the scripture. God's people, it's time for us to pay attention. And God is saying, I am in control of this. It's not the satellite that you release that can now go all the way to the sun because it has X amount of panels on it that's going to reflect and tell you all about creation. What it's going to tell you about is all about me and how science did not put this together. But I am in control of even science. And I reveal, God reveals to science exactly what he wants them to know and how much of it he wants them to know. And eventually, science will put this thing together. And who is it going to lead back to? It's going to lead back to the one that we have always known and served for our entire lives, Jesus the Christ and God the Father. He will bring this thing to, to the knowledge of the people. You know why? Because every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he is Lord. So all of these things are happening. Wars we know of. Rumors of wars. And I'm just sharing this with you. You know, Nancy Pelosi, she got on the plane and she flew over. Rumors of wars. But the end is not yet. There is still yet work for us to do. There is still yet an open door here and the true word of God coming forth. We are yet moving outside of the walls and moving out to where the need is. We have been discipled, but now there is a need for discipling, for us to turn and make disciples. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, did, died, excuse me, and she was left with her two sons. I like this about the scripture. Elimelech died, and the Bible does not tell us why. Does not tell us what he had, does not tell us how long he might have been sick, or if he was even sick. Sometimes we get wrapped up in the wrong thing. <laughs> you hear somebody pass away, one of the first things you want to know, well, how did they die? Or what was wrong with them? The Spirit of God is letting us know, it doesn't matter. What matters is, did you die in Christ? Did you die in Christ Jesus? Did you know him in the parting of your sins? That's what's important. Does your legacy, your life, reflect Christ to the point where others can reach him and come to know him? Because that will live far beyond the breath in our body. The stories and what we share about Christ is a foundation. And when you create a foundation, regardless as to whatever else crumbles, a foundation remains. And so when you're moving your family or when you're making choices on your family, have you sought God? Because the most important thing is that they come into the knowledge of God, that they live a Christ reflected, that they live a life reflected of Him. Why? Because souls are dependent on what they can see in us the light because if you don't see a light then how else do you know how to come out of darkness light and when light shines darkness disappears it cannot comprehend it it cannot confine it, it cannot contain it and so we want to be where our light is shining when ships are out on the sea they're looking for the lighthouse in the midst of the storm or in the midst of the sea because it guides them to the shore we are here guiding souls to who to Christ to righteousness our motto and I believe it's the motto is just see Jesus but if my conversation is everything else but Jesus then how is anybody going to see him if my life and I'm going about it on a daily basis only serves me and my family and the things that I want to do, then people are going to mimic building a life and a family that serves who? Serves them. And allows them to be able to promote who? Their family. 
but not reflective of Jesus Christ. So here, it's not important why Elimelech died. We know that he died. And Naomi was left with her two sons. Naomi is now a single mom raising two sons. And I love this because I was encouraged by this. Naomi raised two sons in the midst of having relocated to a new country that she was not familiar with and having now to learn the ways and to provide for the family with two sons. And you know what? They grow up. And you know what else they do? They take on lives. Which tells me that they, she had instilled in them the responsibilities and the right way of knowing what to do. Because if you grow up, young men, and you're not trained to first seek God and to love God, the next thing is you need to have a job. Work is important. Work is important because it provides. Work is also important because it teaches responsibility. It teaches you how to manage. It teaches you how to be responsible. God worked. In the beginning, he created what? The heavens and the earth. And then he rested on the seventh day. We have the first example right in our Father of what it is that we're supposed to do. Naomi was no longer a help me, but that didn't stop her from doing what she needed to do for her family. She moved from the role of help me to now being what? A widow. But as a widow, she didn't hide under a rock. The Bible doesn't tell me she hid under a rock. It tells me her two sons grew up. So it tells me that they had to do something in order to be able to sustain the family. And sustain the family she did. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other named Ruth. After they lived there about 10 years, both Milan and Kilion also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Naomi family's dynamics change. But as you read on, it does not say that they, they neglected any part of their responsibility. Because why? They were able to move. They knew to go back once they heard the word that God had now attended to Bethlehem. They were able to prepare themselves to go back. And I didn't read it here, but something I'd like to about the two women. They are now the daughter-in-laws. And they were more than just daughter-in-laws. They took Naomi as their mom. They felt just as much love for Naomi as if she had birthed them herself. And even though there was this misfortune of them having lost the men in the family, they wanted to still love her. And they asked her, as she was preparing to go back, to go back with her. They wanted to go back. And Naomi says, no, as she's on the road getting ready to go, she says, go back to your mother, that God may visit with you and give you, in other words, new husbands or husbands. Orpah asks, and then she goes. But something came to mind about Orpha. Sometimes when you're raised in a family, you're raised with the understanding of, if I say something to you, I said what I said and I meant what I said, and you don't ask me again. And so although she wept and although she wanted to go with Naomi, there's a chance that Orpha's raising was where she could not press out of respect for the elder. Sometimes you've got, sometimes you do what you're instructed to do, although inside 
you love and it's not the thing that you want to do. But you go because you've been trained not to question or to press elders. When they say something, you respect what they say and you do what they ask you to do. And that was what I gleaned from Orpah. It wasn't that she didn't love Naomi or that she just wanted to go and to be with her mom and have a new, and have a husband again and have a family. It could have very well been that she was trained not to, not to press or question the choice of an elder or what an elder says. And many of us understand that relationship because of the time in which we were born. There was a time when you were young and what your parents said, if you didn't agree with it, no matter how you felt about it, you got up and you did it. Because the consequence for not doing that didn't feel so good. And you also didn't want to reap that consequence because it didn't just go away. It created a sense of hurt and disappointment and a lot of different things in you that were more than just the discipline part because that ended. But that recovery time, it took for you to get over how you had to be disciplined, that takes time, right? As you're learning, don't do it again. But um, Orpa and Ruth. Ruth may have come from a different, slightly different type of household, and there's nothing wrong with that. She wanted Naomi to know, no, you are now my mother. When, when we took those vows, you became my family. You became my mother. You became my, my, my all. And I want to remain with you. And sometimes there's something that happens internally that's unspoken and it, it just transfers in the heart and you know that this is right. And you don't have to press anymore. And you know to go forth. God gives you that sense of calmness. That you know that this, this, is, this is right. And she did not continue to refrain or resist Ruth's desire to go with her. When you pray and you seek God and you're walking in God's way, be sensitive to what the Spirit of God is leading you or guiding you or uh, prompting you to do. And don't be afraid to go forth in what God has given you to do. Much like today, we have learned that we are living in a world that does not want to know God. They have turned and are turning further and further away from God. But that doesn't mean everybody. And we have to be mindful that everyone has an opportunity to be saved. And everyone is going to have an opportunity to hear the word. Is God using us to move to a different country and to become planted over there? and to witness over there? Or is God saying remain because the famine that I sent is my love to draw you or guide you back to me. It is to open your ears and give you a more keen sense of hearing. And it is to give you a more keen sense of vision. And it is to humble your heart, soften your heart, so that as I speak, you are willing to say yes. There's a difference, but we have to know the difference. And God is not keeping it from us. His love is allowing him to make the decisions that he makes on behalf of his children. And if you notice, even though these things are occurring around us, God is still sustaining. Because it could always be, and I say this, much worse than what it is. But it's just enough. It's just enough pressure to make those that are ripe in the harvest willing enough to say, Lord, I surrender here, I, however you desire to use me. God knows how to put just enough pressure, 
just enough pressure on the finances, just enough pressure on the health, just enough pressure on what you think is smooth or, or convenient or comfortable to you to get you to move forward. It's not that he doesn't. It's not that he's not hearing. He is very much, his eyes are upon us and his ears are open until I cry. It's when they stop being open that we have to worry. But right now, it is still yet time to seek the Lord. And it is still yet time to get in the will of God. And that is what Israel teaches us through the rebellion, through the constant God sending the judges and God forgiving them and restoring them and then them rebelling again. Is that he yet loves, but he will also correct in order to guide you back. He's not going to just leave you desolate, not yet, but he will guide you back to him. So we thank God for the word on tonight. I know it's a little early, but if you have any questions or if you have anything that you want to share, you are welcome to do that now.
And if that compels the next person to come, great. They have done their job. They have done well in the sight of the Lord. So, amen. I'm sorry. I know I, I, know I always say it early, a little bit early. <laughs> but it's all about the self-control and to learn to manage both their feelings and their behavior. And I'm sorry, but someone else just came to me, praise God. <laughs> and in righteousness, we want to be able to do the same thing. And I'm going to say this point, and I'm really going to close on this one. Praise God. I don't want to do that Baptist close, Pastor Meredith. I just got, I just got here. Take your time. <laughs> but controlling your feelings and your emotions, controlling both your feelings and your behavior, is also important in righteousness. And the reason that that is important in righteousness is because there are observers, right? There are people that are not going to just come to you. They sit back and they observe, and that's just their personality, and that's okay. And your reaction or your response is going to dictate whether or not they will draw close or nigh or know that they can come to you. And so when I was talking about um, the effect that we have, not just how it affects us, but it affects others, that is also important about how we respond because triggers are set in order to get us to go back to that old man and respond in that kind of manner. Israel had triggers, <laughs> and they kept going back. Each time a judge died, they would go back to their ways. Each time God would say something, they would go back to their ways. There were triggers. They weren't mindful of the triggers. It's important for us to be mindful. God has brought you out of something. You are now growing. Don't think that thing is not coming back to tempt you in a different form. Same thing, but different form. <laughs> And it's, it's important for us to be able to identify it. And if you don't immediately and it triggers you and you have the wrong response, just say, Lord, forgive me. Because that also is, is important for souls to know that, you know what? If you trip up, if you do make a mistake, ask the Lord God to forgive you. And then move forward. Move forward. Don't let it hold you because you're no longer bound. You are free in righteousness. So I'm going to give it, I don't know, but you're not? Okay. So, again, anyone have anything they want to add before we hear the close? Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Facebook. Thank you, everyone online, for uh, being out on tonight. I pray that you got something out of the word on tonight. Thank God again for each and every one that was able to be out on tonight. As you know, I'm just not long-winded. <laughs> but I thank God for this opportunity and for um, Pastor Smith and allowing us to stand and to be able to uh, exercise our gifts on this month. And with that being said, we're going to stand and we're going to pray out. We know that because of COVID, we're going to remain in the area in which we're in. So if you have any questions, you can feel free to type it in the comments, and we'll make sure that we respond. Amen. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity to read and study your word together. We thank you, Lord God, for this open door that you have blessed and you have kept us, Lord God, with a mind to be faithful to the work that you have given unto us. Lord God, we thank you for the example of Israel. Although, Lord God, they have fallen many times, we thank you for the love toward them, Lord, that you were able to guide them back unto you, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, that you have not left us on today, Lord, but that there are things that are occurring in this world, Lord God, and we pray that it will draw us closer to you, Lord, that it will give us, Lord God, an ear to hear, eyes that we may see, and a heart, Lord God, that we may receive, Lord, your will for our lives and walk in the path that you have established for us, Lord. Not so that the snakes stop biting, Lord, and that we stop dying, Lord, but that, Lord God, we truly do your will for the upbuilding of your kingdom, Lord, that souls, Lord God, may want to know what shall they do to be saved. We thank you, Lord God. We trust you on tonight. We thank you for all of those that are here, Lord, and that are online. Lord God, we 
pray that as we leave this place, not from your presence, that you will cover us and keep us until we meet again. In Jesus' name.